it is very important that we write in our own voices and our authentic voices and that we write for Black women and write authentic stories and don't feel like we have to filter that through whiteness. And yes, there is a fear when you send it off that it won't be accepted. But then my biggest fear in writing The Sisters Are All Right, it was if I had written this book and Black women would have said, what is this? Uh, <laughs> you know, if it had not resonated with that audience, then that would have been a big problem. Welcome to the podcast, Tapping Creativity, with myself, Matthew C. Temple. And each week, we're going to dive into questions and issues and inspiration around creativity and the creative process. Hey, welcome to today's show. I'm super excited to have with us Tamara Winfrey Harris, who is a writer who specializes in race and gender and their intersection with politics and pop culture and current events. She's a writer, author, speaker, and a general badass who unapologetically addresses the needs and issues of black women, girls, and femmes through her work and her writing. Her most recent book is the second edition of The Sisters Are All Right. In my humble opinion, first of all, I feel like this is today's women, race, and class. Uh, if you haven't read Angela Davis's book, it's great, but grab this one first because this one is just coming out right now. <laughs> and first of all, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so this is so great. And, uh, you know, I'm serious. If, if I'm going to spend my time interviewing somebody, I actually really take the time. And as you can see, this is not just for I show. I love that. <laughs> this is for real. I mark up my books, but I'm also a little bit... Uh, and say I may be a little bit anal, so instead of like writing all in them, I use little tags and stuff. I like you're not a dog ear person. No, you don't I want like, to violate I, the page. I yeah. know it's kind of weird. Like sometimes I think yeah. I should, and every once in a while I'll go through a period of time where I'm like, I'm just writing all over the thing, which also feels kind of good, but it also there's this little part of me that's like, oh, don't do that. Just get little flags. And so I get little flags. And there you go. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on the show, and it's actually in the subtitle of your book, and it's Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America. And I'm focusing on this word narrative. And I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on this, because I think when it comes to the the stories that we tell, uh, that we read, and everything that we say, is really, it's a story, it's a narrative, which means we don't actually have to change the world, we just have to change the freaking story we're telling. Yes. Yeah. So part of the reason that I first wrote this book, right, was because I was sick of the story that I was hearing. So it seemed like you know, every headline, every conversation, every Sunday sermon was about Black women as problems. It's like, oh, my God, they're too Black. They're, they're too broke. They're too sick. They're you know, too fat, you know, they're too single, they're too independent. My favorite was too successful to be marriageable. That was my personal favorite. <laughs> and <laughs> that like bore no relation to the black women that I knew, even ones who were broke or fat or single, because it was reductive. Um, and it robbed us of our humanity. And a lot of it was rooted in these stereotypes that were like 400 years old, created by people who hate us and needed us for Greece for the American economic engine. And so I was tired of it. I wanted to talk about the narrative. And then I wanted to interview Black women about what our lives are really like, which is a lot more nuanced and hopeful than narrative you get. Yeah. And in fact, uh, this is called The Sisters Are All Right. And I'm sitting here reading this. First of all, there were a couple of times where I was like, oh, now I'm starting to kind of brought to tears. And my new favorite saying in this book is, it really burnt my toast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love that. What she said, I love that. <laughs> I'm like, that is great. Like some of the stuff in this book will really burn your toast, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, um, but it's, it doesn't mean don't read it. it just means be, be prepared. You might cry a little bit and you might also get a little bit angry. Um, and uh, as, a, as, a, as a white man, I'm perfectly, I've been, I, and speaking of narratives, White men, that's kind of the only one we're really allowed to have anyways. So um, so I, I see anger. I'm like, oh, great. I can I, I know how to be angry, right? Like white men, you can be happy and you can be angry. And not the, when you only get two and shades. it's awesome there. when you're angry. You get a show on Fox News. You can rant and you can rave. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, I should probably have honed that a little bit more. I'd probably be a much wealthier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh boy, I don't think I could do that. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, any, but you know, but kind of going back, the sisters are right. Even just as a as, as a title, I, you know, you talk a lot about that, so you can you can share a little bit of, about that. But I'm sitting there, I get about like I don't know, maybe I'm a quarter of the way into it. And I'm thinking, all right, like y'all are more than all right. I mean, I, I actually am pretty much of the belief that, uh, and this is probably just as reductive as ever as anything else. So I apologize in advance, but I think y'all are going to like save the world. Quite honestly, I mean, let's be honest. There's like Michelle Obama, what a badass. Stacey Abrams, just even saying her name makes me like makes me tear up. I think she's such a badass. Beyonce, Kamala, you, my wife, like y'all are a good group of people. Um. But you chose the awesome, (laughs) right? (laughs) We are awesome, and so more people should like, like more people should see that about us. We are fabulous, and so I hate that I have to remind some of my sisters that you're okay. You're you're all right, and all these people who are saying you're broken, and all of these people who are pointing out your problems, many of which are because of racism and sexism. You need to understand that you are not your problems and that you are intrinsically valuable. Oh, I spent last year um, in yoga teacher training. Um, and so, you know, that idea really resonates with me is if we can be aware, if we can be aware of the way things really are, then we can change what is happening around us. Yeah. So, um, so last thing before I kind of move on. Why do you think changing this narrative is so hard? And I want to kind of give you this kind of funny example that I found. When that movie Salt came out with Angelina Jolie, uh, this guy I worked with, he had a big problem with it. And his big problem was like a woman like pulling herself up by one arm, I just don't find believable. And I found that I still laugh about that because I'm like, but yeah, you go watch a movie with a dude in tights and a cape who can fly and you have a problem. Like, I don't get it. <laughs> Uh, um, but like why do you think that this is so hard to change the story because you know all of these things are kind of hypnotizing right so these stereotype types are fed back to us you know in television our entertainment in our news you know very often even for black women you hear it from people who are supposed to love you You hear some of these things preached over the pulpit on Sunday. You might hear them from your mom. You know, you might hear them from your dad. And so it's, it's hypnotizing. You you say a lie enough times and it feels like truth. And so when someone says, no, black women, that's not true. Then people are like, what are you talking about? So it makes it really hard to replace that old narrative, which again, has been around for centuries with something new. Yeah. And, and I think actually the ones you just talked about are the most insidious, insidious ones. And that's actually why I think it's so important in the stories that we tell, even in the narrative stories or, or, or whatever is like, you know, my wife said, you know, the blatant racism, it's like the Fox News talking heads. That doesn't bother me that much because like you guys are ridiculous. What bothers me is these systemic things or these little hints or like you said, the the preacher from the pulpit, the friend, the mom, the, you know, or the people who are like, not you, but like those things are terrible. Right. Right. You know, you know, even little things like there's a woman in the beauty chapter that talks about growing up in Kansas and hearing all the time that you're pretty for a black girl. You know, it's just that that little thing like I'm complimenting you. What's the problem? Um, but you're pretty for a black girl. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You know? Yeah. I, I, I remember reading that in the book. So obviously you write a lot and I'm curious, you know, writing a book is challenging. And I'm sure the first when you put this all together, right, this is a second edition. But to get to get a book together with all of these interviews and actually go through this whole process and finding a publisher and getting it out there and and all that that's that takes a lot of work and dedication and can you tell us a little bit about your your creative process and going from I have an idea to I have not, not only the first edition but a second edition of a book so you know writing a book has always been my dream since I was a kid because I was a, a weird bookish child <laughs> Uh, who like to read and curl up with a book. And I think for anyone else who is a writer who is listening, 
you know, <laughs> my best advice is just to write and to find time to write. And that was the hardest thing. It took me three years just to write the proposal for the sisters are all right. Um, because I had a job and so it was start and stop and life got in the way, but I keep, I kept writing, um, partially because it was something I was so passionate about. I had the good fortune once to have dinner, Greek food with Tanana Reeve do. And I don't know whether your listeners know who that is, but she's this wonderful spec fiction horror writer. And she said, if you could just commit to write one word every day, um, because the reality is, if you sit down in front of your computer, you're not just going to write one word. You're probably going to at least write a sentence. But if you do write one word, then you kept your commitment to yourself. And so, like, my creative process was a lot of stop and start and write one word and write a sentence and erase the sentence. And, you know, so it was a three-year progress. But I feel like creating things it's always a marathon and not not a sprint right. you know yeah and so that was three years just to do the the um the book proposal and then there's the waiting for a publisher to bite and then there's the writing it so from the i want to do this to uh i sat down and wrote that first sentence or that first word rather of the uh of my book proposal until um, you actually had your book on a bookshelf somewhere. How long did that take? Probably four or five years altogether. Um, and then it took me another six to write the second book. So I'm going to try to get on a faster plan. So, you know, I don't want to be on like the George R. R. Martin plan <laughs> where I'm like a book every 50 years. <laughs> I'm going to try to speed it up next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you, you got to you, you've, you've got to stop taking that that advice quite so literally of one word a day. Yeah. <laughs> one word thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's great. Um, so I, I heard that uh, you are in talks or have already started to develop this into a series. Is that true? So, yeah, it is true. So um, Wise Entertainment and Gabrielle Union's production company, I'll have another, have optioned the Sisters Are All Right to turn into a dramedy. So they are shopping that right now and so cross your fingers that we will see sisters on the small screen soon <laughs> that's oh. great <laughs> first of all congratulations secondly i've spent Thank most you. of my my career in the entertainment world and i can say writing a book is hard getting a show made wow um <laughs> uh, <laughs> but i'm curious in those conversations I, you're taking something that is a that is a work of nonfiction. And sort of fictionalizing it. So how has that process been in either developing it or if you're not fully in developing it, even just the the thought process of it in the meetings and the beginning of, of cracking this story into something that's narrative? So what's really neat about the idea that they've come up with and, and Wise Entertainment did a lot of the work here is that they're thinking about telling it through the story of reality television of a group of women, a group of friends um, that uh, are brought on a reality television show, which I thought was brilliant because a lot of these stereotypes are intentionally crafted through reality television. Um, and, you know, they're edited and reality television is casted in order to use these, these stereotypes that people feel comfortable with because nobody wants to think when they're watching Bravo. Like, you just just give me the stereotype. So I thought that was a, an inspired idea. Yeah, that is a very inspired idea. And it just made me realize something. You wrote in, in, in here about that. And I think you said, you know, there are some women who are willing, who are willing to perpetuate the stereotype from, you know, for, for money and a moment of fame. But the insidious side actually is on the other side, on the programming side, when you're when you think from the narrative level, like you can't write a narrative story anymore and be that stereotypical. You can't do it. You will be so shut down so fast. You don't get bowied anymore. You don't get, you know, these stereotypes. But if someone who's a 
quote unquote real person shows up and do it, well, then, hey, I, I'm just showing what's real. So it basically allows content makers to kind of bypass the what's socially acceptable. And it's almost like I think it was Stephen Colbert who once pointed out when when uh, and I think it was Fox News was doing a segment on global warming. And they're like, we're going to we're going to do fair and balanced. Right. And that's also obviously I rolled my eyes if you're listening to this and you can't see that. Um, but but he's like, wait, if you have 98 percent of scientists say that this is a real thing we need to focus on and two percent don't. But you bring one of each. That's actually really skewing the story a lot. And I think right. what you're saying is that if we of all if what we're doing in these reality shows is basically highlighting Maybe it's only 1%. Maybe it's less than 1%, but maybe it's, maybe it's 0.1%, but you can find that person and you can put them and therefore they become, you know, now a perpetuator of this, of this story. That's just not the case. And it, it and, and it's real. I guarantee you in all my, I am 50 uh, in all my 50 years, I have never seen a woman throw a glass of wine in another woman's face. I have seen it many times on reality television and it's real. So of course it happens. Like it's, you know, those shows are casted and crafted in order to sell a particular narrative. And when we watch them, and I certainly do, we have to know that. Yeah. There was one section that I uh, read that I thought would be something worth reading and sharing. And if you have a book, I would love to hear it in your beautiful voice, unless you have something else. But I thought this just kind of in the top of page 56... Let folks perceive you, that little section. Did you say 56? Uh, 156, sorry. 156. I was about to say, do I not know my own book? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny that you say that because some, sometimes I'm sure you're <laughs> probably a little bit blindsided. Wait, I wrote yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and this this is an interview with the, with the wonderful author, Disha Filia, who wrote The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, which has won every literary uh, award this year. And she said, tell them, as Troy Maxson told his son in August Wilson's Fences, don't go through life worried about whether someone likes you. You best be concerned that they do right by you, uh, preaches Disha Filia. Let folks perceive you however they want. Jezebel, angry black woman, welfare queen, as long as they get the hell out of the way and let you do your thing. Stop looking for approval and permission from people who hate you and want to see you fail and stop spending all your energy railing against their perception. Give yourself a daily, weekly, monthly allotment of outrage and then be about the business of building. Let the church say amen. Amen. <laughs> 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 there are two reasons why I wanted 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 that little section. Tell me a little bit about uh, the person who who shared that with you. So Disha Filia is an amazing, amazing author who has a new collection of work called The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, short stories about black church ladies. And she said church adjacent ladies. It is about the role of the black church in women's lives in playing a role in crafting the narrative and sometimes perpetuating some of those stereotypes that I write about in The Sisters Are All Right. She is a, a, a tremendous writer, so I recommend anyone listening um, to learn about her and learn about her work. Yeah, and I, th I think that's important. That also is a really important key is that, and because one of those things is about taking responsibility of the narrative. I feel like you've done that by uh, in this book by by shining a light in. Um, you know, in these areas also where you say we're, we also have to change our own narrative. You know, we can't, you know, mm -hmm. I, like those talking heads on Fox news is a simple example or a policy that is just so wrong. So many places so often, like there's only so much we can do about that, but where we can really start is within ourselves. And, and one of the reasons why I think this is important is it's beautiful and it kind of sums up something in the book, but also, you know, as an artist and as a creative, as a writer for you and me and the, and, and, and the audience is that you write this and then you have to send it off. And I'm sure you at there, like, tell me there gotta be time when you send it off. You're like, Oh, I'm not good enough or whatever that narrative happened to be. Right. 
And so if, if y- your listeners can probably, I believe this is online, you know, Disha and I actually did, had a conversation for Bitch Magazine called The Only Gaze is Our Own. And it was about being a creative and writing and centering Black women's voices and stories. And very often when you're a writer, you know, people will tell you, okay, but the publishing industry is white. And so you need to write and make sure you're writing so white people understand you, which means having to explain, you know, and your reader. So if you're writing for black women, they know immediately that you didn't write for them. Um, when you start explain, like, allow me to explain to you, black woman, what this re- means. <laughs> you know, for both of us, it is very important that we write in our own voices and our authentic voices, and that we write for black for black women and write authentic stories, and don't feel like we have to filter that through whiteness. And yes, there is a fear um, when you send it off that it won't be accepted. But then my my biggest fear in writing The Sisters Are All Right, it was if I had written this book and black women would have said, what is this? <laughs> you know, if it had not resonated with that audience, then that would have been a big problem. So if I had gotten this great big book deal and then the people that I wanted to read the book would not read it, that would have been a bigger problem. Wow. I completely get that. And there's got to be a, a, a concern too, right? Because you're putting yourself out there, you're putting your yourself on the line. You're, you're saying, this is something that I have poured my, you said five years into, what if nobody likes it? And you know what? It happens actually all the time where you can spend five most years. Most of the, most of the time, I think the average nonfiction book sells 200 copies. So you know, a lot of amazing writers who write amazing things, no one reads it. And that's hard. That's hard to think of when you've been dreaming of doing a thing for decades and you finally get it done and it does isn't received in the way that you hope it will. So I think the best thing you can do is write true. Mm. You know, write honest. Right. So right. at least you can love what love what you create. That's mm-hmm. really beautiful. And I think that's actually a good piece to kind of close with, which is that at the end of the day, people are going to think what they're going to think, or they're going to believe what they're going to believe. They're kind of the two pieces is that we can begin to shift that narrative so that over time, not today, not tomorrow, but sometime in the future, we're going to build something new. And so therefore it's really showing up for, you know, the, the beginning of all of this work is even for you to write this book, I'm going to assume that you also had to do an amazing amount of inner spiritual and personal growth to be able to even put, do this book, right? That's hard. Maybe that's why it takes so much time. It's only so much growth I can take. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh about it, but I actually think that you really, yeah. you really hit the nail on the yeah. head with that. Yes. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, Tamara Winfrey Harris. Oh my goodness. What a complete joy and pleasure it has been to get to know you, share this, uh, this time with you. It's been wonderful. It's been so fun. For everyone listening, the sisters are all right. Changing the broken narrative of black women in America, the second edition, which has a new chapter on black women in power. So if you only have the first edition, grab the second one, because seriously, we've had a lot of shift in that particular part of this narrative in the last uh couple of years really so um so there's that grab your copy should be out now and uh, once again thank you so much thank you so much support local independent booksellers amen 